and the rest of you. We've got a, uh, a neat uh, seminar scheduled here for, for right now, and I'm going to make the introducing, introduction of Bruce in a second. I want to do the rules for the microphone one more time in case somebody was asleep when we did it before. In the past, when we videotaped these events, we have not been able to hear very much of the conversation from those of us in the audience. In order to make that happen this time so we can capture the questions and the comments as well as the answers, we're going to be, we have this microphone that is available. So during the presentation, if you have questions, if Bruce allows questions during it, uh, raise your hand, a microphone will be brought to you. And just flip the switch up and turn it on and then start talking when, when allowed to do so. That will enable us to get everything caught onto, uh, onto our tape. So now I want to introduce Bruce. When I was here uh, two years ago, I've been involved in GSL for just three times now. And I came here and this, this car won best of show and I'm thinking in my mind, who in the world is Bruce Owen? I thought I knew people and stuff going on in the industry, but I'd never heard of him. So let me, let me read a few things to let you know that uh, this is not the first car he's ever built. Bruce actually says in his bio here that he enjoys doing this kind of thing, which I do as well, I mean, talking in front of people. He says here that he's, over the years, I've built many models for customizer Carl Casper, Bob Lavery Jr., and some others. But to give you an idea of some of the things that he has, has accomplished with his model building, starting in 1973 at the MPC International Model Car Customizing Championship, International Champion. 1974, the next year, same contest, first runner-up. 75, same contest, international champion. 76, same contest, international champion. 77, first runner-up, same contest, 78, same contest, international champion. Then he skipped a little while and came clear to 2003, <laughs> where he got first place it in uh, Mark's Custom Clinic. 2003, Hobbytown USA National Champion, which I'm sure gets you three kits, I believe, is their award. 500. <laughs> 500, okay. Most I ever got from Hobbytown is $150. <laughs> 2003, he won the GSL 19s uh, awards with, with this model here. Let me read what these are. Best in class custom, best original design, Gerald Wingrove scratch building award, best paint, and best in show. Bruce Owen. Yeah, thanks everybody. I, th I know some of the guys, I know Bob from way back, he, we've uh, built models way back in the 70s and I know he was around then. And, um, I put together this presentation uh, really in a very, this can be very casual. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to walk through stuff. If anybody has a question, time, if there's many time constraints, I think 12 o'clock the, they have a bus to the tour. So if everybody, uh, we have at least until that much time, we have some overflow. And uh, as we go through, I tried to put together uh, a lot of pictures and some ideas and stuff. So there's, there's actually some slides where there's just some text there. And we'll kind of walk through it. And if anybody has like quick comments, and I think we can get through this. And uh, I can learn a little bit from you. And you can kind of learn a little bit about me. Um, thing is, I have to index this manually and I'm not sure the best way to do this. Um, Can we just bang the space bar when you um, yes. If we have to go back and hit this key here. Yeah. But it, what I'm saying here is uh, you're only limited by your imagination and I think guys who know me I pretty much don't set any limitations on the models that I build. Pretty much any idea that I have that's what I build. And uh, I think there was some comments last night, guys were saying they're the happiest, I think Mark was saying, Jones, he's the happiest building what he likes to build, and I'm the happiest when I build what I like to build too, and I was just lucky enough to win Salt Lake last, two years ago. Okay. And I want to welcome everybody, this is uh, uh, an honor for me to actually to be here uh, to, uh, to present this, it's uh, really a dream come true. I'm from uh, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I was born in Owasso, Michigan, raised there, and then moved to, in 1977 to uh, Swartz Creek, Michigan. 
Uh, I've really been building models probably like you guys since night, about eight years old, maybe even seven. And most of those I blew up with firecrackers. <laughs> my uh, family includes my wife, Marcia, and son, Brent. They're here. My daughter had uh, final exam, so she wasn't able to come here today. But uh, here's some things that I, people really don't know this, so I try to give a background. I enjoy building one-to-one uh, -one full size show cars, car collector like uh, I've got a couple of cars that I've collected over my life, uh, do RC racing with my son, uh, collect some models and die cast some, some of it, it's mostly cars that I've worked on at GM. I like st doing stained glass, learned a lot of things about modeling from doing stained glass. You guys, if you haven't did it, it's uh, will improve your skills and of course painting either models or full size cars. Uh, I'm an engineer for General Motors, doing mostly quality on new launches right now for uh, metal fabrication, uh, metal fab division for DEI at the Warren Tech Center. Uh, but I was building models long before I had that job. But models actually helped me get this job, so that's, I can't say anything bad about it. Right now I'm working on several quality launches, and then I'm also a member this year of uh, uh, GM SCCA racing team, so we've been having some fun with that. The models that he mentioned, these are some of the, that are, uh, I just popped these in today, as a matter of fact. These are models that I built during the 70s, the one in, in the uh, MPC uh, contest. Some of you might recognize some of them. Okay, then I returned to the hobby that was really my first love. Uh, I, after I got done, I went back, finished my degree and all the things that you normally do. You know, build a house, start a home, and then, uh, but I really wanted to go back to my first love, and so I said, well, in 2003, I'm gonna go back with a new model, and uh, premiered it at Salt Lake, and, and uh, it was a dream come true. And uh, you know, it's been in a few different magazines, and uh, I'm really proud of it. Okay, planning be, uh, began with just an idea. It's just an idea, it was almost like a, just on a napkin kind of thing. And then the, uh, the idea of a concept car that would be like a quality of a Riddler car. And I'm sure you guys you know, like the Oakland Roast or so and Riddler Ward. And uh, that was the goal to make it of uh, that kind of quality of what a Riddler Award car winner would be. And, and it varies. Uh, primary focus was to focus on what the original idea, not try to change it based on anything else, and then just try to engineer it, be original, and have a lot of, as much quality as I could put into it. And then I took those ideas and I made some rough sketches and things to begin to visualize the car. The sketches were then tweaked into the, into the shapes and proportions and the things that I wanted it to do. And then the next, after I got it really the way I wanted it to look, then I took and made uh, scale drawings of the body and uh, of the chassis and basic drivetrain. And I've got some of those electronic uh, that are on here, some of the, the first concepts of it. I settled on a scale, didn't know exactly what scale I wanted to go to. I went for uh, uh, 125th, so I thought it was the uh, level of detail would be something that I could try to set a benchmark for. Uh, drew top side views, rear views, front views, whatever. Uh, and then uh, it would be diff the, the model would be difficult because I really didn't have anything to start from. So that was uh, the most interesting part of it. So it was really, I had to design it and build it from scratch. And, the, and of course it was to take, bring the car to GSL and uh, to strive to do my very best. And uh, the background on, I think probably some of you know, I think Mark actually put something in there. Uh, the word virtue, the original word that comes from virtu, which is like a, uh, set the standard pretty high because that's kind of like a, uh, an example of like a one of a, one of a kind masterpiece, so I had to live up to, I set my standard high by putting the name on the car, so I had to work extra hard. Okay, while I was building it, it wasn't easy. I ran into a lot of, lot of roadblocks that frustrated me. And uh, two, what I found, two things that can happen, you either table it, and I'm sure everybody's got one of those on their desk right now. You table it, you can't move on with it, 
you're not sure exactly what, what's standing in your way, either that or you just step over that whatever you wanted to accomplish and move right to the, uh, to kind of rush it through. And a lot of times I found it's because I had lack of ideas or, or maybe uh, uh, time or material or, or a process or didn't even understand exactly how to accomplish, but I had the idea and I kept the idea in front of me. And then uh, a lot of times I hear, uh, uh, when I go to different shows and I've been to a bunch of different ones, people say they can't do something. And believe me, I used to have a whole bunch of things that I couldn't do, but because I tried to do what I'm telling you right now, just keep it in front of you, keep working on it, and you really can do anything you set your mind to. Uh, and then we, we all have got different God-given abilities, but I think that with a, a, a strong will and a, a lot of prayer on my part sometimes, I think uh, it, uh, and then add a little bit of thinking to that, and uh, I think most ideas that we come up with, we, we can figure out a way to do them. At, le at least to the best of our ability at that time, and with that, that really brings our progress, uh, uh, with me anyway, over, over time. And if you're like me, and I know if you're here at GSL, you really want to improve your build each time you build. There's no doubt about that. Um, and that's, wh that's where we're learning. We're all doing that. Actually, th this audience is probably the serious modelers in, in the hobby. Um, and because of our dedication, I think, is where we improve our skills, and, and, uh, and really that's where the hobby has went. And as you, as you know, you get a lot of new guys, you kind of try to encourage them as they come along in the hobby. Uh, tell them that this doesn't happen overnight. A lot of times this stuff takes time to build these, what I call building blocks. You know, you got one part of, the, of it down, then you move to the next part, and the paint and body work or modifying. Uh, what I found out, it's less about rushing to the pro get the project done, it's more about focus on your thoughts. That's how I've really learned the most uh, of what I want to accomplish. And uh, I found after when I built uh, Virtue that I really enjoyed building the car. When I got it done, it was almost depressing. <laughs> so, arriving at the end was not nearly as, as much fun as it was building it. And I think everybody, the joy you gain from that, everybody understands that. Okay, so we're getting into it now. So I had a, had a design, it was like big deal, you know. Uh, but there was a lot of things that I wasn't able to do or didn't even know exactly how to do. Um, I didn't want to give up on it, so I kept pushing on. What, you know, what equipment would I need? Uh, uh, first, I had to determine what I already had and what I might need in order to uh, be replaced, upgraded uh, with new tools, whatever. And I, you know, I went out and bought new Dremels and a bunch of other different things. Uh, had my ask, had to ask my so what would my workbench look like? You guys probably seen this picture. It's, a, like, the, it's like the day before I left from Salt Lake. It's a, it was just a disaster, but it, the whole work area is not that bad. I don't have a picture to prove it, but. <laughs> uh, this is something I found. I found as I was building the car, I had to really make some storage areas. It really helped me up. Uh, when you're trying to build a model, with this many pieces, man, it takes a lot of organization. I actually was stopped because I, could did, I couldn't find stuff. So keeping organized as you go and having you know, very deliberate processes and things really helps. Because uh, I say I come right to a halt and trying to keep everything straight through the whole process and it, it was way over 1,200 parts. Uh, and I think I already touched on this, your work storage cabinets, uh, you know, how secure you're going to have them, you know, so that the cat doesn't get into them. That never happened to me. Uh, first, you need a place where you can paint, you know, safely. Uh, I've got a backdraft box that I made, and there's pictures of it in here, and you can see it. It's got a strong filter, or fan and filter, and uh, it pulls out all the paint. That, a lot of guys overlook that. I think safety is really a big thing. Uh, feel free, like I said this earlier, feel free anytime, ask questions, 
during the presentation. We're not going to really rush through this. We should have plenty of time. But uh, after, after the question, you know, please remind me where I left off, though. So if you do uh, ask me a question. Uh, safety, really important. You guys take a quick look at this. I, I wear side shields. I do all that. Of course, I come from a manufacturing background, so uh, my eyes are very important. If I get something stuck in my hand or eye, I make sure that I uh, make sure that uh, I take care of it. Um, I don't don't wear gloves around anything revolving. I have friends that broke fingers doing it, um, and or sprain them to where they didn't have use of them later on. That hurts too. Uh, safety, every aspect. Right now we deal with a lot of different compounds. Everybody has material safety data sheets and all this, but everything is toxic. You know, you should wear respirators, you should wear it all. All this safety stuff, um, I think it's important not to take that shortcut. Um, and like I said before, if you do get injured, seek medical attention. Most of the chemicals and things that we work with are, are really dangerous. Right here, this is my disclaimer. No cats were injured during building this model. A few fell off or got pushed off from time to time, or I ran over their tails with my chair. But uh, they were, they, most, all of them survived. <laughs> This is just some pretty basic uh, tools that I used. Uh, you can see down through, these are my basic tools. And these are some of more of the advanced uh, drill press, jigsaws. Uh, and, and if you don't have some of these, most of them can be, you can pick them up in flea markets, you can pick them up in a lot. I mean, I bought them at garage sales and, and there's some really good stuff out there. You don't have to put a lot of money out to do it. Uh, Flexible shaft machine is probably my uh, biggest friend. A speed controller is great too. Uh, as far as your attachments, you know, there's so many attachments out there that were even around, weren't even around in the 70s and stuff. And uh, it's it's kind of nice now in this day and age you can actually go out and buy what you're what you really want now. Before you had to kind of improvise. Uh, dedicated workbench. I try to have good lighting overhead and actually lighting on my bench. You can see maybe in the one picture. Uh, I have, have at least one or two workbenches where I work at. Um, try to choose a safe place to store my stuff uh, when I'm not working on it because sometimes you work on it for a month and you're not back for another month. Um, I try to keep my area clean. I don't have any pictures to prove that either, but it's, it's, it's pretty it gets pretty messy after a while. I got my own dedicated broom down there. I don't know who brought it down there, but. And I have storage boxes for the different tools and things to try to make it so that when I get ready to do something, I actually can jump right in and do it. Ah, basic materials, probably most of you use these. You sheet brass, aluminum, sheet plastic, tubing. There's tons of it out available. I know some guys in Canada were having a hard time getting some of this stuff, so if you can, uh, Help one of those guys out once in a while. There were some materials in some areas of Canada that were not even available. Uh, different fabrics, ribbon, uh, plastic solvents, epoxy, uh, all uh, just uh, different glues, super glues, and uh, uh, flexible uh, adhesives that work really good. Uh, Right now, I think probably most of you have most of your soldering skills down. I, I have a couple of different soldering guns that I use for fabricating brass uh, from a 30 to 100 watt irons, depending on the case. Some of them with variable controls. Uh, using silver solder at least 2% or higher is real, I, what I use. Uh, uh, and use a really good quality flux. If, you, if your flux gets old, just throw it away and get new because the, the new stuff really works better. I know most of you are probably like me where you just keep uh, reusing it even when it gets bad. Okay, today now we're getting down to where we got some pictures and things and I hope you guys have some questions. Uh, it's basically a slideshow of, of kind of from the beginning to the end and I hope this uh, presentation serves everyone with uh, idea starter on the current or future projects you have. 
this was the original, the original sketch of the layout for the chassis. And I stayed pretty true to this. I tr really wanted to stay to what the original concept in my mind was. And uh, the car was designed to be a show car. So I wanted to have a, uh, a rear engine only because of the way it showed, the way, the way it showed. And, uh, but I wanted the unique suspension. It's uh, double tubes in the suspension area, cantilever suspension, um, transaxles, onboard disc rotors on the rear. Uh, at this time, I hadn't even settled on the induction, but I had the center mounted cantilever. There's yokes for the both front and rear, almost mirrors front to rear. Uh, rack and pinion steering was already incorporated. Uh, all tie rod ends, ball joints, everything just as though it was a real car. Uh, the front radiator has a frame bracket where it bolts on and off the chassis. We got a question back here, Bruce. Sure. I was just wondering what you used for software for the drawings. What program? Uh, this one, it's a, uh, it's a JPEG format. Uh, this was originally done as a bitmap file, this one. And the one before was done in a uh, AutoCAD uh, software. No, at home. <laughs> I got, I've got my own. Uh, this was the original sketch of the body. It was kind of the basic concept of what I wanted to go with. Stayed pretty true to it. I didn't know exactly at that time. Cut lines changed. Lots of different things changed, just, just like they do in the real car. Um, some of the proportions even changed. And, uh, but that's the basic con original. Uh, first time I turned it into electronic format, I had sketches of this. And that's what I kind of want to say. If you're going to build a car where you're, you're building it to your idea, you know, try to put it in at least one view first. If it's just a dead-on straight view, or, and then start to rotate it around, create some ISO views. And uh, I don't have any of those that are electronic. I they need to be scanned and stuff, and eventually they will be, and they'll be, uh, I'll be showing those later. Uh, this is just as a sketch version of a picture, just to kind of give you an idea of this is when I rendered these all out, I tried to get different views and, and of exactly how I, how I wanted the car to be viewed as I was going uh, through the process. Go ahead, there's a few of these. And I've got like these three quarter front views. I, I, I've got some, all this stuff is archived on disks. I was trying to find them all and I had a hard time finding them. And these are different different, uh, just different views of how you kind of want to present it when you're, when you're doing these sketches. Good. Okay, here we're back to the back work area. It looks almost full size. Uh, you see, there's, there's a lot of information in this picture. Most people don't see it. But if you really study this picture, there's, uh, there's a lot going on there. Uh, to the left there, I got my tunes. Listen to the Beatles a lot. Got my clock. Of course, the clock's always a big thing. There's no dates on anything, but it does have a clock. Um, got vices uh, on the side. All my hemostats and other tools are all clamped right there where they're easily within reach. Different types of tape. Like I say, this was a bad day. Normally the trays, I'll put all my different files and things like that, so there, everything is just right in front of me uh, when I'm working it. I've got a lot of stuff that's overhead. Uh, usually things that you don't use often are all stored up there, supply side things. So they're all within easy reach. It's a little bit different view of it. I threw it in anyway just because it showed a couple things other than what the other. Uh, this kind of an example of w parts that I make out of just a solid piece of brass or aluminum or whatever, just get the idea. You can see in the background there, there's kind of a sketch of what I wanted to do. Just basically hand fabricated it, went through the process. That's why I found out my camera really took good close-up pictures. Of These are just during the fabrication. 
just whittle, as I whittled along and followed my sketch. Okay, this is where I took that, that sketch that I had and turned it into a 3D metal model. The, uh, the ears that, that the uh, upper and lower control, control arms are, are all in place. Uh, like you see, it's a single fr frame in the middle, splits to double frame in the rear. Uh, rigid front and rear motor, motor mounts for the uh, for the engine. Most all the holes are already uh, in the uh, frame for mounting the uh, oil cooler, trans cooler, cross members, rack and pinion steering. All the all the holes are in the frame. Just another view of it. There's the wheels. Um, I know you, most everybody knows there's different tools available or different photo etch stuff available. I photo etched my centers. Uh, this design's carried throughout the whole car in the uh, sill plates, uh, oil pan, uh, radiator shroud, wheels, and other places in the car too. The same, same design. This is a design I've had in my cars and my full-size cars. Uh, if anybody's ever seen my Camaro that I had, that I, st I still have it, but it, I, this is the, kind of the design that I use and I carry that through the whole car. Uh, they're, they are quadruple out 160, uh, the, all the wheels bolt on. Windshield frame, uh, the car was concepted to have a um, carbon fiber type uh, windshield frame, where the, you would actually take a composite of the windshield and it would actually bolt into the car instead of the way windshields go in. So I wanted this windshield frame to be something that is quite difficult to actually get it done, painted in the car, and fitted correctly. Another picture of it just fit when I was fabricating in, in copper. The shell, I've got some pictures later on. This, this body was all uh, sculpted. I sculpted it in clay. And then from that I made temporary molds and then eventually permanent molds. And uh, that's how I made the body. You can see the complexity of it. It has conventional door hinges, so I had to have front body hinge pillar for the hinges to bolt, bolt on to, as well as uh, all the other hinges. and pin mountings and for the uh, fender skirts. And uh, this is probably when I had most of the stuff fitted, you know, of course, before paint. Another picture just inside changed color with the uh, indoor outdoor lighting. It's a floor pan. This all, all the uh, holes are already in it for mounting the uh, seats and seat tracks. It has sliding seat tracks in the car. Uh, and your seat belt uh, anchor mounts. Uh, the inlay for the uh, handle is in the door. This is door outer prior to paint. At the front of the door, there's a, uh, to the right, there's a close out area. So when the doors are closed, er everything, it's completely closed out where normally in a car you'd be able to see through to your seals and it was designed that way, correct? Sure. You can probably even take another one. That's good. Yeah, it's a little better. Yeah, in the door inner, I had the inlays. There's uh, oak wood that's actually inlaid into here. And then uh, there's a metal handle here. And then there's fabric in these two areas. All the inlays are in here. These are bow speaker inserts that went into the doors. Probably a lot of people haven't seen it. You, now that I go through, you guys take another look. I wanted the, uh, the hood inner, I wanted it to be really art, kind of an artistic thing. So when it's open, you could see. Um, I'm around a lot of uh, hood inners and uh, on different cars and stuff. And this one I wanted to be, 
where it would actually be possible to build one like this and, and have the structural strength. Of course, it needed to be stiffer through these areas where the, uh, to support it, and of course on the outside for the corners. The hood outer, <coughs> the uh, hinge mounts are epoxied in here, and those are basically, then it bolts on from there. There's nuts from the inside. It's totally blind. Uh, these are copper headlight inserts that were made for in here, and then uh, lucite uh, lenses were fabricated inside those. Same thing here, this is a epoxy bonded for the, uh, there's a plate with uh, studs and then these are bolted in and most of these are all blind now. And there's a uh, intercooler air box that mounts on the inside right there. Inside here there's vents here for the engine and then these vents here go to the intercooler. Dash, inlaid uh, Bose speakers again here, uh, radiator, uh, or I should say defroster grate goes in here, and another asymmetrical bow speaker here. Uh, dash insert uh, assembly goes in here, and then the steering, of course, comes back all the way to the steering wheel, has working steering all the way back with U-joints uh, in between. This is the uh, left wheelhouse assembly. The, do the battery uh, bolts in. Uh, there's a tray and the whole, whole thing, a lot of things you can't even see on it. It's uh, got a... Delco Freedom battery in it. It's got the script on it and everything. This is the other wheelhouse. The tires, <clears throat> I got down to the point to where I didn't know, couldn't really find the tire that I wanted and the rest of the car was already scratch built so I decided to build the tires too. I made a master out of brass, solid brass. Uh, uh, photo etched the, the tread pattern, the high speed tread that I wanted and then put the name of the uh, car, it says Virtue RSX here and then BE Owen Tire on here. A lot of people never never saw that so like last, last time. But it's got the nut wrap around uh, high speed tread and then I, from the master I made these tires. So maybe you have a When you photo etch the uh, the tread pattern there, was that like a flat strip with the, the pattern on it and then you yes. wrapped it around and soldered it? Yes. Okay. It had to measure everything. That's where your trig and uh, your uh, pi R squared all. Yeah. yeah. How did you deal with <laughs> meshing the tread pattern together at the seam? Math. Okay. <laughs> Math comes in handy th with yeah. these projects. Yeah, this fir this first real good. No, it, it it it's really helpful, and and just for that reason, it came out, and uh, the tread came out for just the perfect blend. So let's go. There. Sure. Uh, I had two questions. One is, uh, did I understand you correctly that uh, you made all the uh, parts like the wheels and so forth without a lathe or a mill? No, I have a lathe. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have a lathe, and I have my an improv mill that I that I mill with. Okay. I mean, that one, it's not something you go out and buy. It's something I made. And what type of resin uh, products did you use to for this? Case? Polyester. I use polyester resin, regular, you know, fiberglass polyester resin. Um, it's because it's all I knew. Um, in order to be able to sand and see some of the air holes, you, you know, they have an additive in the seats. Um, I put that white additive into it. I found it actually just slowed down the cure time, uh, but I wanted to be able to see really well when I was finishing the, uh, the seat, like in this case. The ones that are all green are kind of the brownish green, the way they come out in the pictures. That's all polyester resin. Uh, and like A pillars are all fiberglass reinforced uh, so that they should stay there for quite a while. This intercooler air box this is probably the only other one that's not polyester. This is UC40. It's, it's kind of a little harder than styrene. You can buy it at paint stores, or not paint stores, but chemical stores. It's expensive. It doesn't really work any better than any other, but I made a few parts and they're very permanent when you make them. Um, this is another polyester. This is the rear firewall. It's got some of the uh, anchor points and for the gas tank straps and stuff already in, in the firewall. 
and the clearance for the rear uh, hinges to come through here. This is the point where it's, uh, people say, well, did you ever get to the point where you felt like you wanted to quit? And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, sometimes it was like three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> because you get to this point right here, you really got a lot of work on your hands. It, I mean, it, it's, it's great to get to this point, but man, finishing it is, is, it, is, it is really where the, really the joy begins. It, more joy when you get it done, though. But th this was uh, a challenge to get this thing uh, materialized in, and then try to figure out how to assemble this thing. Now we got to make the body fit <laughs> and the uh, interior, all the, all the different components uh, within the body. And it was, uh, you can see there's a lot of tape and uh, a lot of mock-up, and during this process, you got you got to make provisions for all your paint. You can't go back and redo it. So this this probably takes about the longest time. All your clearances got to be just perfect. They got to be like within. I checked everything to like one thousandth of an inch, because after you get done painting, you, they they just don't fit together if you don't. All your door gaps, windshield frame. You ever make, this car, well, I did, we hadn't got to the clay model, but this car was designed in clay and it was entirely point checked. I checked every point to make sure the car was perfectly symmetrical um, and then worked the, the rest of the design into it from, from there. Excuse me, Bruce, you, uh, you commented about clearance and accommodating for your paint thickness. What kind of level of, of thickness did you kind of come up with as a rule of thumb because obviously the first time you did it you'd have to guess and then you, I guess from experience. The more, the more familiar you are with your, the paint that you're going to use because I mean I've used lacquer, I've used base coat, clear coat. Uh, base coat, clear coat, a lot more clearance. Uh, doesn't mean it has to look bad. It can actually, actually I think clearance has come out great. Lacquer is a little thinner, a little less clearance. So you're talking uh, probably, thou, five pro thou? probably in a couple thousandths for lacquer and probably close to three, three or four thousandths or fi even five thousandths for base coat, clear coat, maybe, or even a little bit more. Okay, thank you. This it got kind of exciting when it was on the bench, you know, and you, and you see this, you kind of get the, for the first time the body, I mean, I'm just uh, ma ma matching the body to the chassis. Uh, hoping that I can get every, all the clearances and everything the way I wanted. It was kind of exciting. And uh, at that time, all I had was some red plastic for the windshield. So you see like the windshield glass looks kind of red there because that's all I had at that time. Uh, this grill is all uh, photo etched and, and soldered to kind of match the rest of the design of the car. Um, everything's pretty well bolted in place. You can see uh, uh, got I use tape on the body and stuff as I'm working with it because you just, you know, after a while your fingers get sore and it's hard to pick, you know, pick edges and things. And so I actually put tape on things to kind of, kind of hold them when I'm doing all these clearances that we were just talking about. Um, it, it uh, and then guess what? It opened. The first I put the hinges on and stuff, and uh, to get the right amount of throw, I've actually got some drawings with the side view where I actually calculated this is so close this underneath here it's only like two thousandths of an inch clearance as that thing swings forward so I wanted to swing as tight to the body as I could so I actually went in and created in CAD the the exact uh, radius that it had to swing then you, up here you got your uh, uh, cross member with your uh, vacuum booster and master cylinder radiator all this stuff is pretty much fabbed up at that point not and then there's there's more detail that's added to it later but this is the during the basic buildup you can see right here too that through the through the plastic that's where the it's like the conventional door hinge bolts in here and then bolts into the a pillar this is how I kept everything straight we were talking earlier about uh, this time I was at Saturn Corporation. This is one of my temporary. I forgot my badge that day. I don't know if nobody's ever did that before. And uh, when I got home, I just stuck it on one of these. Uh, but I went through and 
had to categorize everything. These were most of the plastic parts of the car um, so that I knew where they were. Use a lot of Ziploc bags and things like that. Here's some of the metal parts. There's a bunch of them here and a bunch of them there. Uh, every, every detail, every piece that I could uh, poss excuse me, possibly make. Here's your wheels. You see there's actually an extra set there. I may use those someday. These are all the body molds that I made uh, to, to make this car. Um, it actually was a, a little bit time consuming, but I'm glad I got them now. This was the uh, original clay model, uh, mock plug they call it. And this is a, the first temporary mold that I made off of this and eventually this mold was made where the body is, this is a clone body or an additional body right here that I made just so you could see them side by side. This is probably just before the tear down, all the, everything clearances here, you know, for the rear view mirrors in the door, um, the uh, rear, rear view monitor, the license plate, which you probably, some of you guys know the history on that. So I got my daughter's birth date, my son's birth date in it. It's an, I actually took a manufacturer plate and scaled it down and then added those numbers to it. They normally have an M here for Michigan. And uh, it has all, it's exactly uh, a Michigan manufacturer plate. As though it would be uh, a concept car that you would see out on the street or at a, one of the GM shows. That, this is what I was hoping to, with this. This is two just before tear down. The, the handle is already being fitted it for the body prior to paint. Uh, there's vents down here which were ended up uh, painted them in carbon fiber as well as the grill here. The headlight bezels were uh, chromed and then this was also carbon graphite. So it had carbon, car sort of a carbon graphite uh, theme with the red. It, it's just prior to tear down, the air box is in place. Uh, everything's fitted. The latch, latch points for the hood with the latch uh, that go in the top. The brackets for the gas struts and everything's pretty much in place. A little bit different angle. You see in here this top plate. Uh, I've got RSX on here with that same uh, scripting that I used. You can see the seats are in place. Center console, it, it uh, has some of my ideas of what I think is a comfortable interior. Uh, part of the uh, specialized uh, steering wheel that it's little, there's other pieces that go to it later on, but then the uh, billet steering column is in place. The wipers are in place. Just all prior to tear down, the, you got aluminum vacuum booster and that, you can see most of that. The detail's not all in there yet, but it's there. Some other shots. Um, different views. Twin turbocharged uh, small block. And you can see the grill now, or the uh, defroster grill. Okay, now we're ready to paint now. We tore that thing down and uh, well, we're going to start the uh, paint in this uh, 125th scale model. Um, what I did is I actually had just these ears chrome plated and then went and painted the rest of the frame. That was fun. This went through the primer. Uh, it's got all the, you can start to see all the mounting points a little clearer for all the different parts of the car. Body through primer. Of course, checking clearances, there's a point where it becomes, uh, you can't go any, you can't change it anymore. Another view of the a body, in pretty much in the final primer state. Clearance for the uh, steering, billet steering column and steering linkage coming right through there. On the other side too is the inlaid aircraft gas cap on the other side. These are just some of the other parts all primered and, and ready to go. Inner panel, 
almost to the final fitting at in the primer is the last time you can actually do any changes to it. The paint when you get to the base coat clear coat is just too so thin that everything has to fit. The hood uh, outer panel. And we start the top coat. <coughs> it's almost by accident that I took these pictures. I'm really glad my, my son took them and uh, glad we took them at the time. Um, it's beginning to cut it in, cut in some of the color. Um, use a pache, single stage, uh, respirators and things. Uh, this is a uh, this is the fan I've got actually pulls it through and then I've got a back draft uh, filter which really really does make it clean. Um, it's just another another angle of, of cutting in the the uh, jams as you call it. Yeah, this is probably one of the most detailed pictures I have it while I was in, in the prop before that until it was finally done. And uh, you see most of the holes are in the body all ready to be mounted together. Okay, polishing and plating. Had all this metal stuff and uh, some were going to be painted, some were going to be plated. Uh, this is the uh, rotor, um, caliper, hub. And uh, then this is where I quadruple out 160 and bolted the wheels on. I actually, in the, this is 2.8 millimeters, and then I actually put the RSX in the, in the center of that. These actually will fit right on a dime. I don't have the picture here, but you, in the next picture you can see you can set it, you can actually take and set them right on a dime. They're small. They're ready to go. Final assembly, frames all painted, uh, these yokes are all in place, everything's ready to be bolted on, you got to be really careful. Um, I use PPG base coat clear coat and uh, it's a little bit fragile to work with so you got to really watch your clearances or you can break it pretty easy. Um, there's a dime to show you, give you an idea. Uh, most of these, I just set them down and took pictures when I was going through just to get an idea, so you get an idea of when you get to this point, what it would look like. Right here now, beginning to bolt the shocks in and the uh, rack and pinion steering here. It's a little bit different background. Okay, almost in one day, I bolted pretty much all of the chassis together, less the motor. Uh, this upper cantilever A-arm, this is attached permanently to the upper A-arm. All the, they're all bolted in, the A-arms are bolted in. Um, your brake line mounts, uh, all the li linkage for your steering, and of course your shocks, everything's bolted, all the suspension works, all four corners ball joints upper and rear and all your tie rod ends and links. Almost the same mirrored suspension in the back, cantilever uh, also in the rear, onboard discs and rotors on the transaxle. Uh, and then in between on the floor pan, they're, they're hard lines because the uh, radiator goes up here, flexible uh, steel braided in the front and then flexible from here back to connect to the engine water mount or water pump and etc. You can see some of the script that I put in the upper radiator top plate, a little bit more detail on the rotors, caliper, and suspension. In the back, I actually put the virtue in the top of the air cleaner. This is a bank style twin turbo. Uh, you guys are familiar with those, but I just scratch build it from uh, with the uh, air air cleaner here. A little bit more detail, the front suspension. All the brake, all the brake line attachments and everything just like a full scale car. Try to put every detail that you'd have in a real chassis. Shows pretty good clarity. Uh, U-joints for the steering back from the rack and pinion. Threading this through the car was really difficult at the very end. 
<clears throat> you couldn't go backwards once you got it together. Um, the rear rigid mount, motor mounts kind of uh, interweaves through the water pump here. Um, serpentine belt system, uh, air conditioner, alternator, uh, brackets, custom made all those, top plate, the entire motor is brass except for the block. The uh, valve covers, even though you can't see it, say twin turbo RSX on them on both sides. See a little bit more detail there. I got the uh, turbo clamp clamps here. Muffler clamps are on each side. Here's your idler, idler system here for your serpentine belts. You see the alternator bracket a little better with the bolts, bolts and everything. This, this linkage right here, this is the, the follow through for all the electrical for the car actually comes through this tube in the middle instead of through the back of the firewall. All this has an HEI ignition that I created and it has all your wiring and looms uh, right down to, uh, made my own spark plugs that actually have boots and everything for the wires. Uh, the rest of the hardware for the turbos, the oil uh, for the bearings. A little bit closer shot for the detail. Inside here, I've got an air filter with a filter element, the white and black, just like what you'd put in a regular car. Uh, you see a little bit of the detail. The um, brake calipers and rotors are, are center mounted. U-joints, half shafts, each side. This is where we're on the wheels now. We've got the wheels on the car. You can see the tread a little bit better. You can see some of the scripting in the sidewalls. It's a hard urethane. Hard. Um, one, uh, some of the softer urethanes have a tendency to go bad, so I went with a, it's a hard, one of the harder compounds. It's, um, I figured it would last a little bit better over the years. It's probably one of the one of the better detail views from the top. Here's your condenser for the air conditioner, all the, the hoses, fittings for the air, uh, the the um, fuel injection lines are all in place, um, fuel pump, pretty much every detail that I that I could have, all the even the brackets for the uh, air conditioner and the alternator bolt right into the engine, as well as the valve covers. And here she is. Now this is probably just prior days or so. Now you can see right here, there's one of the rear calipers mounts directly to the transaxle with, with the rotors and then it's got two U-joint half shafts that travel through and between the split frame. Um, down, these, these have a split, there's actually got, got a, uh, a split in the square ends. There's muffler brackets that bolt to the frames, uh, frame on either side that are kind of clearanced out, you can see those. And then the day of trying to figure out how to get it together, this was really, I knew it, I knew it took quite a bit when it, when it was still in the raw state and now I had all these other parts on there to try to get them threaded through and put the car together and this is like the last moment before I tried it the first time. Yeah. And it went together. Uh, most at that time, most of the interior wasn't in. That was kind of a challenge. Uh, the floor pans and the, all those things were in place but it was impossible to put it all together 
prior to assembling the chassis and the body. We've got a few different views of the body, some of the detail, the aircraft gas filler cap, the keypad, uh, like I said there before, the side vents for the oil cooler, and uh, now the radiator and stuff is now in carbon graphite as well as these colors. Manufacturer plate now, and uh, actually then added the uh, ex expiration tag, which I think is like two, 2011 I got on there. I think. Um, you see now the, the gas tank, gas tank straps are in place, all the fittings and fuel lines, the uh, connection to the uh, aircraft side mount with all the aircraft fittings, uh, twin turbocharged, um, and you can be, you know begin to see this uh, the rear end panel is now in place with the colored lens. These actually have lens light bulbs in in there, the little micro bulbs. I think one picture that was in Scale Auto that actually had the lights were on. It's the only time they've ever been on. Um, just another another picture of it. Wanted to have kind of an an all out outrageous show car, and that's that was the that was the idea. See the manufacturer plate pretty well. This was the this was the fun. There's my wife on the right, Marcia, and my daughter and my son at last GSL. And the awards were nice. It was great. It was it was it was, it was just the most exciting moment, you know, of all the models that I ever built to be able to come here. And this brings me to the next point. I met Augie for the first time two years ago. And uh, we hit it off really good. Great guy, great respect for him, he had great respect for me. And uh, I'll never forget, it was just a great moment. Uh, I had a chance to meet with him a couple times since the last GSL. And, uh, and uh, he, when he came over, he says, you know, can I be in the picture? And I said, absolutely. And so we actually got a couple different pictures. So I'm sure you guys feel the same way. It's pretty, pretty nice, a pretty great moment. And uh, I think we're all going to miss um, one of our leaders in the hobby for sure. Uh, this is one of the virtual pictures that uh, Greg used in model cars, uh, which is kind of cool about it. It's, uh, it's Thomas Edison, and this is his workshop in the background, so it was kind of cool. <laughs> some background on it. <laughs> These are some uh, different pictures that just used some virtual pictures, and they uh, had some help with my uh, wife's cousin, uh, Laurie's a got a great camera and we did some combination of some photos and and uh, got some pretty neat stuff. I think there's two of these that uh, Greg uh, used in his article. These are taken I think at uh, Henry Ford uh, Greenfield Village. The picture's great background. It was kind of interesting. There was kind of a mound there. I said, hey, we've got the picture of the car. If you stand about right there, this is going to be perfect. So it worked out cool. And really picturesque fountain. These old stone buildings are great. This is another one that Greg used in the... Uh, Model Cars magazine, it was pretty good. Cool. I have kind of an off-the-wall question, but did you ever uh, consider 
what would happen for uh, if it was in a wind tunnel? Any yeah. kind of that kind of work on it? Yeah, actually, I, I'm lucky enough. I, uh, I'm my plan is, and I've got had interviews and stuff. I spoke with some of the leaders at GM, and I plan on going into the. Uh, I mean, this car would be pretty hard to do the way it is. You can't put it through wind tunnel, but. Uh, it would be something in the future. We may be able to scan it and then create a 3D model of it. We've, we've got that capability now. A friend of mine just bought the ability to scan it. May even end up making like a Hot Wheels of it someday. That's the plan. Um, d did you have any uh, real disasters that really challenged you to, to fix or repair in, in building this? No, actually, actually, most of the... <laughs> Yeah, there were there were some anxious moments. I broke a few pieces, had to go back and remake them. Uh, there's a lot of pieces I was making, and I remember the parts real well. Never found them again after they flew across the room. <laughs> <laughs> Set me back a little bit. <laughs> From a scheduling point of view, I was just curious as to uh, when you finish this uh, in relation to the last GSL. Um, those pictures, most of them with the car completely assembled, were taken in 2001. So most of the final construction was in the last two years. And what have you been doing since? Um, I, I built a, a box art for a model that's going to be coming out for texter, testers. It should, should have my name on it so you'll be able to see which one it is. Um, uh, it wasn't wasn't done in time, or I would have bought, brought one of the boxes or brought some of them out. And the, it's a it's a re-release of uh, one of their earlier models, but I'm really not supposed to say. But uh, that, and I've did uh, doing some professional modeling, and uh, like I say, we've been working with the SCCA, just kind of taking a little rest. I work long. I do have some a render, renderings of the next car that I'm going to build and not, don't really know, ex I sort of know what different things are gonna look like, but I don't really know exactly yet. I mean, how the whole thing's gonna come together. Don't know, hours, uh, about five years, about five years. Uh, like you say, you have different setbacks and you only have a certain amount of time you can work on. You can't really work on it full time. While I was building this, I was, uh, uh, work, I was working on the Saturn LSLW. I spent about two and a half years in uh, Germany. A lot of the designs I did while I was over there. Uh, I traveled back and forth for two and a half years and then I spent 14 months in Japan and I did a lot of the, while I was on the road designing. And then when I got home, then I tried to build those parts. So it was pretty pretty busy. Bruce, did you do your own plating? Uh, no. Um, Flint Plating did most of my plating. Flint Plating is the name of the And all the nuts and bolts, did they uh, plate those as yes. well? Yes. Uh, there is some stuff that I did plate. There's a few pieces that I did do. Did you have trouble actually putting the nuts and bolts together after they were plated, or was it fine enough? Um, it I made pr provisions. Way I, the way I did it so that they didn't, didn't build up. I didn't get the build up. Everything seemed to fit okay. There might have been just a couple of parts that it, it impacted. And your photo etching is very crisp. How, how did you do that? Um, I've got a process that I developed. Um, and uh, it's the same as what it is commercially available. It's just, it's exactly what everybody else is doing. It's just that I've set up my own shop to do it. So I've, I bought the, their kits and then I've improvised them a little bit. Uh, all the little nuts and bolts, is there a little tiny tool or something that would hold them together? How do you okay. bolt them Good together? question, good question. Um, I made them because there isn't any tools to hold them. Uh, when, you're, when you're handling, you know, you guys use 
quadruple out six, 160 and even some smaller stuff, man, it's gone. If you, I mean, I improvise. I, I mean, I use tape, I use contact adhesive, anything in your, in your mind you think, try it. And that, I, I, even when during the construction, I actually use wax even to hold on to things. Uh, I learned that trick from jewelry. The jewelry trade uses a lot of hard uh, waxes.